Hello, Leap Motion developers. I want to show you a little bit more about how this project is set up. So I have a Leap Motion controller, Raspberry Pi B+, breadboard with a bunch of servos, which are driven by the Leap Motion controller. The piece that connects the Leap Motion to the Raspberry Pi is a HTTP web server that's running on a PC. The Leap Motion is plugged into the PC and the Raspberry Pi has a Python script that's sending web requests to the PC to get the proxy data for the Leap Motion controller. All right, so let's take a look at how this thing runs. All right, so let's, let's start with the Python script. So this is a Python script. We've got some imports for doing various things like GPIO for interacting with the servos date time for time handling, time for sleeping mostly, URL library for getting, uh, doing web requests to the proxy, threading for doing the web requests in a thread, you know, because you don't want your web request to interrupt, interrupt the, uh, uh, the servos moving and whatnot, and JSON because the proxy data I send back in the JSON format. And then, uh, here we go. So these are the different pins that I have it connected. Okay, the Raspberry Pi came with this cheat card that tells you what all the GPIO inputs and outputs are. So I use this. And when you look at the code, uh, these are the different servo pins that I've connected for the servos. And it's good to make sure that you've, instead of using 18 in the code, this just gives a context for all the different variables so you know Oh, 18 is the servo pins. Anyways, initially, um, the servos have a fixed rate that they move, and I was kind of calculating the rotations, but it wasn't accurate enough. So right now, I'm just moving the servos to like the zero position, the 90 position, and the 180 position, because that's you can precisely hit those points. Now, set warnings. I just uh, turn the warnings off, and then. For the GPIO, you want to set the board. Okay, so for the five servos, there's a setup that happens so that you can, you tell each of the pins that they're in output mode. That way we can use uh, pulse modulation to alter the rotation of each servo. A couple different variables here for getting the time, so I can get the delta time between update frames. Accuracy is not used anymore. Okay, so last rotation. These are the last rotations for each of the pins. At the end of the update frame, I just keep track of whatever the last rotation was so that when we hit the web server, if that changed, we know something changed. Time rotations are variables for handling time for the server rotations. Okay, so we have these target rotations that's coming from the Leap Motion Controller proxy. So when we request the web page, we get back what the finger positions are and they go into these target rotation variables. Okay, and for the five servos, we use pulse width modulation, and these are the five servos. You set up the pins, and it's at 50 hertz. I've got a log timer thing for doing debugging, because sometimes you want to log stuff, and if you do it log too fast, it flies by, so use a log timer. Then there's stay alive, which if you hit control C on the keyboard, it will exit and then I mark st stay alive to false and then the program will exit when the th and the thread will exit. So it's just to keep a handle on that thread. This is a function definition for getting the rotations. Passes in the target rotation and then there's a little threshold in there for returning one of the three rotations that the servo supports accurately. So it can either be in the 180 position, in the 90 position, or in the zero position. Okay, so the function definition for new target will get the new servo rotations from the Leap Motion Controller proxy. So I have that doing a web request to my server. And some debug things here for printing the content comes across as a JSON object. And here's where I get all the target rotations for thumb, index, middle, pant, ring, and pinky. And the second parameter here is tweaking the values 
for the servos to activate. It's just setting the thresholds there and then some debug messaging so I can see what's going on. And then I'm controlling how fast the client is doing web request against the server proxy so I can get a new target every half second. We use a thread for web requests to make sure that our web requests don't block the movement of the servos. So they're on separate threads. The servo movement is happening on the main thread and the web requests are on a web thread. Okay, we have a function definition for doing debug logging. Right now that's pretty much turned off. Part of the initial setup for the servo is setting the duty cycles to 7.5. That basically has them default to the 90 position. And it's time-based, so when it's initially setting up, I give it a half second to just get into the 90 position. And then I set the duty cycle to zero to just stop the servo from moving. So this is a function definition for comparing the current rotation with the target rotation, and it will adjust the time and do that for you. And it returns the updated value for the time variable. Okay, so we have a function definition for update. It will take a servo, and given the time and target rotation, it's going to handle rotating the servo to the desired position. Based on whatever the target rotation is, it's going to adjust the duty cycle and rotate to those positions. And it's time-based, so it's going to rotate for a little bit and then turn off and wait for the next target rotation. Okay, and now this is pretty much our main loop. So when the program starts, we reset all the servos into the 90 position, give them a second to finish that, print a little message that setup's completed, and then we have a while loop. And the while loop will continue until the keyboard interrupt happens. So if I hit Control-C, it will catch the keyboard interrupt, stay alive goes to false, that will have the thread stop, we give the thread a second to finish, and that's the web thread that's doing the web request to the proxy. We clean up the GPIO so that that'll shut all the servos down, and then print a program complete message. Now in the body of the while loop, it's uh, first thing, it's doing a while true, so it's going to stay in there, and it's going to sleep. If we didn't sleep, it would just go like 100% CPU. So you want to yield, anytime you do a while, while tree, you want to yield in there. And with zero seconds, that'll yield to anybody else. Otherwise, it'll keep working. And we do a little thing for uh, keep, keeping track of the time so that we can calculate the delta time. That's common. I didn't actually use it in here, but it's, it's good to have if you ever want to do time-based stuff. The delta time tells you how much time has passed in the last frame update. I have this log timer for debug logging that will print the current variables for servo position, the target position, and some timing stuff. And then for all five servos, we want to compare the last rotation to the current rotation, and then it will tell us how much time is necessary to do the next rotation if it's necessary. And the update will update the servo and cause the servo to rotate to the target position using that time variable. And that's pretty much it. So this is a Python script. And if I go over to the bash shell here, sudo python, the name of the Python script, will run the script. There we go. And you can see that it's logging the responses it's getting from the leap motion controller proxy. So if I put my hand over the controller, it starts to see the rotation values for the thumb finger index, middle, ring, and pinky fingers. And you can see it's doing web requests. Now, these values, I'll show you in the Unity example what they represent. So Control-C shuts down the program, and the thread completes, and the program's done, and the servos are shut down. Okay, so part of the Leap Motion Controller, there are example scenes, and I've adjusted the example scenes to show 
the values that I'm passing in the proxy. So here we go. So here's the uh, example, the motion controller example. And when I move my thumb, you can see the thumb values on the top left there for how they're being adjusted. Index finger, middle finger, ring finger, and pinky finger. So I use this visual example to figure out what the thresholds need to be for the server proxy, which is just a console app. And it's good to have a visual example, a visual thing, so that you can keep your sanity and make sure the numbers look right. So you can see, like, keep my hand straight here. The thumb is, like, at 35 now. If I pull my hand out, put it back in. The thumb starts at 14. Just do this a few times to get your baseline. Okay, now the thumb's at 5. You can see a range of things, actually. And then when, when we put our thumb down, I've seen the values go all the way up to 90. Anyway, so this helps you figure out what the ranges need to be. Same thing for the other fingers. So this helps you get the thresholds. Okay, so I've made an adjustment to the hand controller C sharp file. So that I've added an on GUI event. And in the on GUI event, I get the current frame. And just a little error checking if there's no hands. If the hand list is null, just return. Otherwise, we loop through all the hands, loop through all the fingers, and we want to get the proximal bone and the distal bone. I have a little if-else case here to populate the name field based on the finger type. If it's the thumb, index, middle, ring, pinky, I get a nice little name there, or unknown, and then I show it in a GUI label. And I'm showing the name plus the first bone and the second bone. We want to get the angle between them. So that's the, ang the angle between the proximal bone and the distal bone. The result you get back is in radians. So I convert that to degrees, just because I like seeing degrees better. And that's the value you see on screen. So it's the angle difference between the proximal and distal bone. Currently, that's what I'm messing with. Okay, so using this example like this, it's just a good way to spot check the numbers, make sure they are what are expected. Okay, so those are the changes that I did to the example, and then I took those and threw it into a HTTP server. So HTTP server is just a console app. An important thing about this console app is when it starts. The Leap Motion Controller has policy flags, and the policy background frames is important if you want the Leap Motion Controller to pull values when your app doesn't have focus. And that's something that I wanted in my case for the server. I don't want to always have to give the, the HP server focus for it to collect values from the Leap Motion Controller. Like I might want to run the server, do other things, and have it still work. So I've added this policy. Okay, so now that we got this background frames thing out of the way. Okay, so this this is the Leap Motion server. The Raspberry Pi is sending HTTP client requests to this server. So how did I set up the server? It's a it has a HTTP listener. I just set up a static, and then when the program starts, I have a static constructor, and it will start listening on the HTTP 80 port, and it starts listening. And then we have our entry point for main. And this mirrors the C-sharp leaf example. So it sets up a leap motion controller listener. The controller sets the policy flags so it can run in the background. Yeah. OK, so we set up some initial rotation values to default to. And this is in case the client re does a request. If we haven't detected a hand yet or a hand's not present, we just want to return 0 for the rotations. Just get something started. The rest is the part of the C sharp example for Leap. So um, it adds a, a controller listener. And then this this uh, while true loop is for the HTTP server. So this is just a single threaded HTTP listener. It gets a contact. So it, it's looping listening for a request to come in. 
when it gets a request, we convert this JSON st structure. It's a we're using Newton soft JSON, and I convert that to a string and re return it each time that the a request comes in. Okay, so this is our HTTP server. It's, right now, it's just single threaded, and it's listening for a connection. So let's see what a connection looks like. So I'll open up the browser, do a web request, and it's going to send back a JSON structure for the rotations for the thumb, index, middle, ring, and pinky. That's what you see here. So it's listening for a connection. When it gets a connection, it gets the JSON data string, puts it in the output stream, and sends it back in the response. If there's any error, it's going to catch it, log it to the console. And then finally, close the response, and then sleep for the next iteration. And I'll just keep waiting for connections to happen. Now, where's this data coming from? Well, I put it into the sample listener. This is pretty much the same as the C sharp example from Leap, except for I've added this Newton soft JSON object, and that will hold the rotations for the fingers. It's pretty much the same, except for I turned off a bunch of the logging and I got rid of the old main that was part of the example because we already have a main and it's basically the same stuff as this. Well, at least the first three lines. So I don't really deal with shutting it down or anything because I pretty much just kill the server. It's just a quick console app that I can just kill. So after commenting out all the log messages, went to the on-frame event and just want to make sure that if no hands are found, we want to default again to the zero rotation position for each of the fingers. Okay, so I've customized the on-frame event in addition to just turning off some logging. If no hands are detected, we want to just return zero rotations. Otherwise, we loop through all the hands, so part of the looping through the fingers, and we want to populate the JSON. So this is similar to the same values that we showed in the Unity example. We're just comparing the proximal bone to the distal bone and getting the angle between the two, converting it from radians to degrees, and then setting it in the JSON string that gets returned by the HTTP server. And then there's some debug logging here to print the status of the current rotations, which get displayed to the console log. And what does that look like? Here we go. Here, I'll bring this over here. All right, so as the hand enters the frame, you can see those events are firing and it's logging when it sees rotations and when a hand disappears, that update frame isn't called, but we can still see, here's this, what we'll pretend like this is the Raspberry Pi. So it's doing a request and there's no hand detected. So you get those values, but if I put my hand over the leap motion controller, refresh the page, you can see that the values are being populated. And this is what the Raspberry Pi client is requesting. So, so there you go. That's the server and the client for Raspberry Pi. And this is the setup that I used so that I could use a HTTP proxy for the leap motion controller so that the Raspberry Pi could use the leap motion controller to control some servos. All right. Thanks for watching.